side, I think what she was trying to do was dispel a sense of discomfort in her, the way she was, her image was being shown to the world. She would take on boy personas and always want to, just always want to play with boy things. And we thought, well, it seems like we have a tomboy on our hands, right? She didn't fit in with the boys, and she didn't fit in with the girls. And it was obvious to her and the other kids. I think she felt that, and so she would truth for people and wouldn't look people in the face when they talked to her. to play boy roles and her need to be seen or spoken to as a boy at home became very persistent <coughs> and very consistent. Those are the hallmarks of a possibly transgender child. Consistence, persistence, and insistence. And she was meeting all those markers. I was confused and concerned and I hoped that this obsession with being a boy would go away. I remember crying because I imagined her eating in the playground and nobody playing with her. I imagined her going to high school not having a date. A mother's heart knows when her child is suffering. He was talking about hating his body. I even found him kind of poking at himself at some point, angrily, wanting to be something different, saying things like, why did God make me? <coughs> why did God make me wrong? A child shouldn't have to live. I was driving up the street and a car was going really fast and it, it made it, so we had to slow down really rapidly. And I said to my friend, if this was the moment where I lost her, what would I have wanted to have done? Would I have wanted to force her to be me up for that one last day? Or would I want her to have gone happy being who she really was? And I think at that point my mind was made up. Uh, it was April of last year. He hadn't yet transitioned Jacob, but he had short hair and he was wearing almost entirely boy clothes. We had a, a glorious trip. We bought him a Prince Charming costume. And he would be stopped everywhere. Oh, how handsome. Oh, your son, he's so cute. And he just glowed. The look of pride on his face. It was like he just he had a ball and it was it, it, a light bulb or something clicked. You know, I think it was. He was really happy in that moment. He was being perceived to be there had been a video that had gone viral of a adorable little boy out of California, Ryland Whittington. Uh, and his parents had, had made a, a video of him explaining process of their transitioning him and clearly this boy is so happy now, so adorable, so full of life and animation and we were very struck by that and we talked about it and we said what if we showed him this video of this boy. <clears throat> when the video finished we asked him well, what do you think about that boy? He said do you think he might like to be like that? Do you think he might like to have a new name? and everyone knows that you're, that you're a boy. And he said, I can't. I have to be me at school. I can be what I want at home, but I have to be me at school. I explained to him that, look, you can, you can bring you to a new school, and everyone will know you as a boy from the beginning. Right then, he said, that's what I want. He said, I want to be a boy always. I want to be a boy named Jacob. For the transition, he didn't smile a lot. I have never seen him throw his head back mm -hmm. and laugh, like really loudly. He's just a different person who's becoming himself. He started looking people in the eye. He started talking about people. That's my friend. Striking up conversations. Yeah. And I realized how much he had come out of his shell and how much being Jacob suited him. And I realized he had never really been a man. That had been a figment of my imagination. I couldn't ask for that. He's, he's amazing. I want him to know how proud I am of him, 
how brave I believe he is, and how no matter what, I am in his corner. And I love him, and I always love him. So that's a pretty common scenario um, for how these kids go through their journey. The part that they're not showing you is all the pieces behind the scenes that the parents probably went through to get to the place that they are right now. Um, and and we, we, our mental health team is really involved in that. And um, one thing that Dr. or that Diane Ehrensaft always says to the families is, we are not supposed to be our kids, you know, bully. Like we are not supposed to be their bully. We're supposed to be supporting them. They're going to have enough interactions with bullies. And I always think about that as a provider. Like I'm not going to be these kids' first bully. You know, I'm going to support them and do my best to make sure this is appropriate care and that they're, you know, that we're doing the, the right thing for every kid and every kid is so different. But I'm going to be their first supporter. You know, a lot of times when kids walk through the door, I, I, I'm having the first opportunity to do that for this kid, you know. So it's pretty, it's pretty powerful and um, really feel honored. So, so we practice by clinical practice guidelines. We don't just make all this up out of, out of um, air. However, medical treatment is not FDA approved for transgender kids. So we have some um, endocrine society guidelines that we practice by, which were written in 2009. The WPAT, or World Professional Association for Transgender Health, um, has a standard of care for transgender um, and non-conforming people. And then the Center <coughs> of Excellence at UCSF has developed some guidelines. And the AAP endorses gender-affirming care as described in its policy statement. So we use a collaboration of these guidelines because all of them are imperfect. And then uh, the WPATH ones are actually, um, um, they're Dutch guidelines. So they have their, uh, their numbers for things like, for example, starting cross-sex hormones, are more lenient. They believe that I think adulthood starts at 16 versus in the U.S. it's 18. So um, it's really a melting pot and then taking each family and kid individual, individually as well when we, when we talk about medical treatment. And these are all being revised. We're expecting new ones out next year. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so what do we do? So medical transition, we already talked a little bit. So reversible care is the GNRH agonist. And that's either through an injection called Luprolide, which you can see at the top. It's kind of a biggie injection. They come in every one to three months, and that they have to um, they have to be at st uh, Tanner stage two to start treatment because it doesn't work on a prepubertal kid. Um, or they can get an implant in the arm, which is good for uh, one year, but we're showing through research it lasts um, up to two years and even longer. So one of those two treatments, um, and then cross-sex hormones, and then irreversible would be surgery, which we're not going to talk about. Um, let's see. So GNRH agonist, how does it work? So the hypothalamus, when puberty starts, starts releasing hormones and pulses to the pituitary, which then stimulate the, testep, the, testosterone, uh, the testosterone or estrogen to be produced in the body, which is how puberty gets started. The GnRH agonist binds to the receptors in the pituitary to stop that pulsing. And so by stopping the pulsing, it stops the, the puberty-causing hormones. And so it puts everything on hold. When the GnRH agonist is removed, the receptors open up, the pulsing starts again, and, and puberty instills um, as it was. So it's that lack of, of pulsatility that um, um, stops the, the puberty progression. So uh, GnRH agonists are luprolide, uh, or injections, sub-Q or IM every one to three months. It's very expensive, three to $10,000 a year. Actually, each injection is about six to $8,000. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we fight, I spend a lot of my time fighting insurance to get coverage for these kids. Um, and then the other piece would be uh, a Strelin or Suprelin implant. And that's an implantable device uh, every one to two years. That's also very expensive. Um, and we have alternative treatments that we can use too. If we just cannot get any coverage for these kids and they can't afford out of pocket, we can do other, other things as well. So GNRH agonists, we tell for the patient, um, you know, within three days, the estrogen or testosterone levels actually increase. So there can be like this pulse of puberty. So for a lot of transgender boys, um, they'll have some bleeding, which is what they, what they want to stop. And then two to four weeks later, the hormone levels decrease and puberty is suppressed. Um, so let's do a little case presentation. So this is 10-year-old Jamie. She <coughs> is male to female, and uh, she is coming into clinic for blockers. Um, she has been assigned, she was assigned male at birth. She's been saying, I'm a girl since two years old. She's socially transitioned in kindergarten. She has very supportive parents, supportive peers, friends, and family. I'm making this case presentation easy. <clears throat> Pubertal onset has initiated for her. She's having increasing anxiety with the changes that her body is going through. She's starting to masculinize. Um, physical exam, she's had her two breasts. She's obese. So we're going to order some tests. We're going to look at her LH, FSH, E2, and testosterone to ensure she's in puberty. And we're going to do a DEXA scan because one of the side effects of using a GNRH agonist is there can be some delayed bone mineralization which um, reverses once you start it, stop it, but it, it is a risk, so we, we monitor their, their bone health. Um, so we do a physical exam, make sure she's in tenor two, so we're looking um, not only at the lab test, but her body as well. And then we do an evaluation. So we're looking at the labs, and they're showing us that indeed she's pubertal, her DEXA score, her Z score is negative one, and um, her vitamin D level is 18, so she's vitamin D deficient, which is very common. Very so, common. Before, the, before the meds or without the meds? For everyone, before the meds regardless, but since we're, um, we have a, a risk for bone <coughs> demineral, demineralization, we're, we're um, checking this to make sure that we're supplementing with vitamin D. So Jamie has a relationship with a therapist. The therapist, however, is not a gender specialist. So you refer Jamie first, this is what we would do, to a health professional specializing in gender to assess the readiness to begin treatment. And then one of the requirements is that we obtain a letter of support uh, from a gender specialist for medical treatment. So our eligibility checklist when a child comes in is that we make sure they fulfill the DSM-5 criteria for gender dysphoria. We need that letter of readiness from their mental health professional. They're at least 10 or 2 stage puberty before we're going to initiate any medical treatment. The puberty changes have resulted in an increase in gender dysphoria. So that's um, clearly defined in the, in the criteria. They uh, do not have any psychiatric disorders that would interfere with diagnosis or treatment and uh, have adequate psychological social support and informed consent for treatment by both parents and the child. So we're going to start Lupron injections. I am Q3 months. We're going to give daily calcium vitamin D3 and we're gonna do some lifestyle modification for obesity. And then every three months, we're gonna uh, monitor height, weight, tanner staging. Uh, um, we're gonna monitor the hormones, make sure she's staying biologically suppressed. Every year, we're gonna monitor renal, leaf, liver, lipids, fasting glucose, insulin, A1C. We're gonna check, keep monitoring her bone health. And then we're gonna do a bone age, which is an x-ray of the left hand to track um, predictable height, which is something that we, we track when we're putting on a gene. So Jamie's on blocker. She's doing great. She comes back to see you every three months. Her labs have been stable. She's now 15 and asks, when do I get my boobs? So we're going to think about starting cross-sex hormones and how early is too early. Like I mentioned, the Dutch protocol says they have to be 16. The U.S. protocols say they have to be 18. We don't follow either of these two protocols to a T. We really look at the family, we look at the child, we look at, you know, we are collaborating with their mental health specialists. We are making this decision. It's oftentimes for kids, we're doing this much earlier than age um, 18, and certainly more around the age 16, 15 age. <coughs> so options, so she's on the blocker, okay? 
and now she's older, so we can either stop the blocker and let her go through biological puberty. So that means stop the blocker, let her um, go through the, the puberty that she was before the blocker. So that's, that's the piece that's 100% reversible. Or we can stop the blocker and start cross-sex hormone therapy and let her go through her, her puberty of her desired gender. Or we can continue the blocker, which is what we like to do, and start cross-sex hormone therapy at really low doses. So those are our three options with her at this point. And she's either going to go through puberty one way or the other, in her new gender or the, ge or the gender she was assigned at birth. Um, so we decide she's ready to start on estrogen. Her insurance covers her blocker, so we're going to keep her on the agonist so we can use lower doses of estradiol in addition to the, to the blocker. And then we put her on 17 beta estradiol, and her choices are either supplement or, or patches. So we talk about what she can expect in terms of feminizing hormones. So all these different actions are the actions of the hormones. Some of them, like we talked about, are reversible. Some aren't. They all have different onsets, and then at the maximum effect of that um, will occur in the far right column. And this is different for everybody, and we're constantly titrating her doses to make sure that she's at the pubertal levels um, and going through that puberty in the desired gender. Um, okay, so some practical application for you all. So, from all this, uh, some takeaway points. So gender is not just about a body part. It includes expression and how one feels in their heart and their mind, as we've learned today. So there are many different genders. It's not binary. There's not just male and female. It can be a spectrum. Gender and sexual orientation are totally two different things. Feelings are never right or wrong, so how one feels about what gender they are is not something that we can tell is right or wrong to anybody. Gender affirmative health care is the law. And it's our job as health providers to focus less on why <coughs> the child is gender expansive and more on what they need for safe and nurturing health care. And like I said, for the most part, these kids are mentally stable um, and their gender is not dysphoric. Um, it's very orderly, just in a non conventional way. So some language we can use. Is blank the appropriate name for me to use today? Or, or what name, what is your name? I often walk in the room and I, and I just ask all of my patients, what is your name? Um, instead of assuming, you know, that, that it matches what's on the record. Um, these are just examples of ways to say it. What is the appropriate name to use today? I will update your, thank you, I'll update your record, I'll let your medical team know. What is your current gender identity? Um, what is your chosen gender identity? What is your gender identity? What is the appropriate pronoun for me to use today? What sex were you assigned at birth? That's important for healthcare, right? We need to know if this child has um, um, ovaries, uh, and even if they're presented as a boy, we need to do health on, on all the internal organs. And um, yeah, hi, what is your name? And this gives us accurate data, quality healthcare, engaging <coughs> care, and better health outcomes. And the last thing we want is someone to come in and have a terrible experience and then um, move forward not seeking healthcare. Try to avoid saying the name legal name, so here at Children's, we actually uh, are about to roll out uh, a new epic banner where you're going to see the preferred name is going to be the larger, bolded print name is going to be the preferred name. And when, when patients come in, you know, we are going to ask them, what is your name? And we're going to update that name. Underneath that, in a smaller font, we'll say legal name and whatever name they were assigned at birth or what their legal name is. And we have to keep that for insurance and legal reasons. Um, especially if they haven't done a legal name change. Um, but it's a huge shift in care, and uh, it, it's going to make a world of difference for, for these kids. Um, try to avoid jokes or personal beliefs <laughs> about transgender people, obviously. Um, but people look to the endocrinology department as like experts in this, right? And just the other day, I was walking through the hallway, so my office is now over at the um, uh, FQHC building, and I came back, and uh, the OAs were in the office, and um, um, I just heard some, some jokes along the hallway about, you know, one of the transgender patients, and I just kind of stopped and um, addressed it. But it's like even the, the, the people that are giving this care all the time and really trying and doing great quality care slip up sometimes, and there is, and we just have to be proactive and make sure that, again, we're creating a gender affirmative 
environment, whether we have a transgender patient in our presence or not. So always, um, always working towards that. And then never assume gender identity based on expression. So if you make a mistake, and I mess up all the time, so <coughs> patients that will tell me like their preferred pronoun is they, for example, and it's so hard in the English language to replace he or she with they, I mess up constantly. And I think I'm pretty good at it. And I always, you know, and at the beginning it was really hard to just stop and say, I'm sorry, I, I recognize what I just did and move forward. But it's just so important. And the more I've practiced apologizing, the better I am at, at it. And they totally get it and they're so appreciative anytime I apologize and, and try to do better. You know, and sometimes I'll walk in the room if it's something that I'm, I know I, I'm going to try, but I'm probably going to mess up. I'll even come out in front of it and say, I know this is your preference and I'm going to, you know, do this. Work really hard to, to not mess up and if I do please let me know and a lot of times the parents are messing up too and so then you know it creates this dynamic in the room but we're all trying and I think that's what matters to these kids is that somebody cares enough to try to get <clears throat> um, if you don't know it's a you know privately inquire don't be in a waiting room or a bunch of other people and ask a question you know pull the patient aside um, make eye contact with them, continue to use their preferred name and pronoun even when the patient isn't around. So that's really important. So when we first started grooming our patients in the gender clinic, we groom, you know, the legal name was John, but it was a transgender female. Her name was Sarah. We groomed Sarah, and then we'd be calling her John back here. We're like, why are you doing that? Her name is Sarah. So it just causes more confusion. So if someone says, her name is Sarah, their name is Sarah. And it needs to be updated in the medical record, updated to the medical team, and then her name is Sarah. Um, consider the parent's perspective. If you're approached with information about a child's gender, listen and, and take it to somebody who you can provide that information to so we can give really quality care. If you notice a, mit a mismatch, ask. If you notice a child, a mother is referring to their child as Sarah, but the medical record <coughs> only says John, that's something that we need to ask about, right? What's going on here? Is there a better name we should we be using today? What's the appropriate name? Um, always use the child's chosen name and pro pronouns. And when unsure, um, it's okay not to use any. So I always challenge uh, my team to do this. Try to treat the patient today without using a pronoun, right? So if, you, if you're uncomfortable asking, you can give a whole, you know, really quality patient care appointment or interaction without ever using a pronoun. A lot of um, cultures don't use pronouns at all. So it's challenging, but you can do it. And then practice, practice, practice. And that is all I have today. I do have some resources that you'll see on your PowerPoint. So when they come in at triage and they give us a name that doesn't even match, what do we register them as, male or female? I mean, how do you know that part? Of it? Yeah, so good question. So registration is only going to be uh, updating the name. The medical providers and the history are going to be updating the pronouns. So if you're provided that information, uh, you can't update it in the medical record, but you can absolutely notify your team. And every team's going to have to come up with how this best serves them in their environment. Well, you won't find them in F because of the wrong sex in oftentimes. So you just have a birth date and a name, or even just a birth date, it has to be a birth date and a sex, or a name that's not matching the birth date. So how are we going to find them? I mean, like so, the na so you can search under their preferred name or their legal name. So it, it, they both pop up. Okay, so what sex are we supposed to put, the preferred one or the legal one? So you're not collecting, so the, the, the sex is, um, is going to be their legal born sex in the medical okay. chart. That's not changing. Okay. Right. It's just name and pronoun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good question. Where is pronoun going to go? It also shows up in the header, so the, um, the sex at birth is in the header, <clears throat> that's not changing. And then if there's a, pron a preferred pronoun that's different, that's entered, it's highlighted in green and it says preferred pronoun. Mm -hmm. And if there's not um, a, a preferred, if you don't see a legal name and a, and a bolded font preferred name, then that person doesn't have a preferred name. And it could be a nickname or any, it could be any name that they prefer to give respectful health care. Point for demographics and um, grant writing, um, many grants ask, are you treating male, female, male to male, or male to female, or female to male? Mm -hmm. At what point will we be able to get that information out of ethics? That's a great question. 
I can bring that to the to the team. So I'm on the um, Epic transgender team, and I'll bring that to the team. That's a good question. That's something to be appreciated. Um, in terms of, this is more physiological, in terms of with the hormone manipulation um, and that kind of thing, how does that affect their growth and their profusion of their growth plates and their final adult height? Um, you know, we can make predictions based on what we know as their biological gender, <coughs> but when we start changing things, do we know? Do we have any enough long-term data to know? No. So that's part of our Child and Adolescent Gender Clinic. Mir Abrams is our clinical research coordinator, and we're collecting all that data. We don't have good information. The information we have, we pull from the precocious puberty population um, that are on the same drug, so we can get some correlations there. But we don't have great data. We just know, when we, as providers, when we're presented with this, what are the potential um, side effects of using this drug that we don't have a ton of research on for this population. And we know that the by not doing it and preventing transition, we're dealing with like suicide risk and by 50% greater by not allowing a child to transition. So when a parent's presented with that, okay, there's a drug that we've been around for a long time, it's really safe, we have a lot of data on in the puberty pop population, but not in the transgender population specifically. But by not choosing to use it, I'm doing all these social risk factors that I know of. Oftentimes, it outweighs the, the, the lack of research on the drug side. But um, certainly understand that it's important, and we're trying to get it as quickly as possible. I have a so more of a social question. Um, and it's kind of twofold. I'm sure you come across parents that are resistant. I mean, they may bring their child in, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely <coughs> affirming. Um, so my question is, do you guys have a program in place for parent education? And my second part of it is, do you have a program for um, educating schools and school mm -hmm. systems? Yeah, so part of our multidisciplinary model, if you kind of think of like the four legs of a table, there's the medical care, there's the mental health care, there's the... Um, um, legal, these families need legal care, and then there's that social piece, the education of the parents, the schools, the peers, and all that. So we work with uh, Gender Spectrum, which is an organization that has a lot of presence here in the Bay Area, and um, they work a lot, so like Joel Baum, who's one of the big educators from that organization, will go out to schools, like the school will call us and they'll be like, we got one, what? we got one what? We got one, you know, we got it, we, we have a transgender kid, and we're like, okay, so let's start there, we need to educate there, so then, then we can send Joel out to educate the school, and it's not, I, it's not, um, you know, singling out this child, it's giving broad education, and we're doing it a lot, and I think that's part of the, the, the slide I had that showed the 2009 versus the 2011 research, I think that's, that's a big result of that research, that just broad research that we're providing, you know, to the hospital, to the communities, to the schools. Um, and then for the parents, yeah, the mental health team works really directly with the parents. And then there's a big conference that's, um, that people come to once a year put on my gender spectrum. And there's a whole day of parent and family. So we refer to that a lot. Um, and then we also do individual care within the clinic. Do you find that personal narratives like that video are the most helpful for parents? when they see it played out it in depends, a family? It that depends what the like barrier is for the family. Because yeah. for some families, they want to accept it, and the parents are affirming, but maybe the grandparents are just like, no. So we, we have to come from a different place there, right? Mm -hmm. Or they refuse to use the chosen name for this child. Or um, a lot of times it's religious barriers. So it's a totally different approach. Um, and it's, you have to take a more of an acceptance, a loving, you know, approach. And, and it's very, very different for every family. I'd say like a lot of them can be categorized here and need to see normalcy in the process and need to see a kid on the other side of the transition that's improved from, from as a result. So absolutely, but I, I would say like every family, even now after we've been treating so, you know, seeing so many families, they all are so unique that it's so challenging and makes the job so fun because it's like, you know, bring it, give it to me. What do you got, you know? <laughs> let's, let's tackle this one by one and, and it's just so different for everyone. Do you use like a, a chaplain 
or some religious figure for families to help them with their incongruency? We will refer, religious. and there's so many resources, religion-based, that we can refer families to specific to what the barrier is. And I'm saying religion because a lot of times they'll identify with a certain religion that um, they just can't, there's that, they just have to get over that first or get through that first, or some of them never do, but, but we have re uh, religion-specific referrals. Is there a percentage of the transgender kids that um, have, they used to call, or I don't know if it's still a term, and they have the used genitalia, and they just allow that child to decide, you know, what sex they're going to be? Yeah, I, just, I know you didn't address it in the talk, but I'm just curious, do you deal with that in your other things, what clinic? Or? We deal with that in the endocrine clinic, and most of the time in terms of transgender for that, it's kids that were raised female, and then it's time for puberty and their period doesn't come. And then you look deeper and you find that they're actually